Welcome to the Power of Love show sponsored by the D.D. Jackson Foundation, where we shine a light on loss and grief and how it impacts our lives. We are here to provide hope, resources, and a community so no one feels alone in their grief. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Power of Love show sponsored by the D.D. Jackson Foundation. We are here to provide hope, resources, and a community so no one feels alone in their grief. We believe that through the power of love that nothing is impossible with love on your side. I am TJ Jackson, and with me is my eldest brother, Taj Jackson. What's going on, T? Nothing much, Mr. Taj Jackson. Uh, We are, for those who are watching, we are live, of course, on Facebook and YouTube. You may also be listening to us on a podcast. We stream on every podcast, um, at least every major podcast outlet there is. So if you want to find us or listen to us that way, that is always an option. We urge and suggest and hope you guys will subscribe to our podcast as it helps others locate the information that we give, which can obviously hopefully help others who are in need or who are seeking it. So please um, consider subscribing um, to our podcast, to our YouTube channel, or following us on Facebook. Um, and if you really are enjoying the content, make sure to leave a review because those always help as well. Uh, mm-hmm. We are not licensed therapists. We are just ordinary people who've experienced loss in our lives. We've been impacted from it. We've learned from it. And we like to share our opinions and what has what we went through to hopefully make it a little bit easier for you guys. Saying that, if you need professional help, we urge you to seek it and to find it. Please, please, please do not just rely on us. Taj Jackson, today's date is September 1, 2021. Um, and I guess we'll start this show off like we do most of the other shows. And how was your week? Good, good. Um, you know, I mean, went to Vegas. Mm-hmm. A lot of people know. Um, and that was, the drive was kind of, I haven't driven that long <laughs> for a little while. And so that was a little hard. I'm not going to lie. In that aspect of it but it was my first family trip in terms of with my daughters for that distance and it was great i mean they enjoyed it well taylor especially obviously because she's older but it was it was a great um vacation cool how was it charge was it tough driving i'm not i'm not gonna lie um on the way back i was getting tired and so tiana had to take over for like about 30 minutes 40 minutes until we yeah. had coffee bean so i could get some caffeine going but before that it was just like i was struggling at one point yeah because then it started raining at one point and then the windshield wipers it, it everything was going against me at that point like the windshield wipers and all that stuff in the rain it's it kind of hypnotizing and stuff oh, it's beyond hypnotizing and, and that so so yeah. Taj, I think most of the viewers, at least who are watching live, know this or listening to us uh, on this September one day, on the first day of this, will know that uh, August 27th and August 29th are, I don't want to say emotional days, but are definitely different days for us. August yeah. 27th being the day we lost our mother, uh-huh. the day she was murdered. Mm-hmm. And August 29th being our Uncle Michael's birthday, who is no yeah. longer with us as well. Mm-hmm. So that weekend, that three-day stretch is always challenging for us. Um, yeah. And um, this weekend was no different. Even though mm-hmm. we were um, at a celebratory event with other family members, at least for me, it was still a challenging weekend. How, yeah. did, you, how did you feel? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's, 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 there's a lot of like the week prior to. I have to be careful and just watch how my emotions are in that way leading mm-hmm. up to it because it's not like I purposely go, okay, mom's, you know, the day that mom died is coming up. It's just, I start feeling different and then I start mm-hmm. realizing then I'm, it kind of reminds me, Oh, okay. This is, you were getting to the end of August because mm-hmm. August starts my birthday, basically on the fourth. So it starts off pretty cool. I mean, I don't yeah. do anything for my birthday, but it, it starts off like, you know, like, oh, okay, it's August. But then at the end of it is the hard one because, you know, we have two people that are no longer with us that are, we're extremely important in our lives. We're instrumental yeah. in our lives. And so it's just, just that constant reminder. Yep. 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 Todd, is it getting easier for you? Those, the three day period? No, but I, I tried to practice what I preach and celebrate, you know, in, in that way, celebrate them. I didn't post anything on mom on the 27th 
I think you yeah. guys did, but I, I, I haven't done that. I didn't do that. I think for her birthday or I don't know if it was that or mother's day. I, I missed one of those two. Um, I didn't want to be forced to post anything, but at the same time, um, I just internalized it. I didn't really feel like posting yeah. in that way. I've kind of taken a break from social media yeah. um, in general. So yeah. yeah, I was, I mean, in terms of celebrating uncle Michael it was great that the Vegas trip and all that stuff yeah. and that whole thing. I, it's great to see everyone celebrate him. And it felt being in that company, it, it felt incredible. Yeah, from and uh, before we get on to our show with our guests, we have a wonderful guest today. I will just piggyback off of what you said. You know, I, I didn't post either for moms the day for moms because I don't know. I am also taking a break from social media. I feel like, you know, I've always heard about the effects of social media and I've always, you know, I, I've seen that. I feel like I've seen the effects, but for some reason, maybe because it's over a year of being in this pandemic, social media has been even more um what's the word i'm looking it's just more difficult than usual it's been more challenging yeah Yeah, it's it's it's, and it really can weigh on you so um and then then i i did post for uncle michael but you know for me birthdays are a bit different than the passing day it's another thing so i don't know but um taj thank you for sharing your experience um and what you went through because I'm always curious to know what you go through because you always seem to have a bit. I'll give you this, Taj. You know, I don't like to give Taj much edge, but he, he seems to. recording. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll give it to you, Taj. You seem to know a lot um, uh, of, you, you have some good suggestions. Let me just say, let me keep it there. I'll keep I'm it. five years older than you, so you'll yeah. get there. Sometimes it seems like it. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but all right, you guys. So for today's episode of the Power of Love show, it is our fifth and final installment of our summer 2021 mental health series. Yes, there are four prior shows that you can catch and watch if you want to catch up. But for today's show, we welcome back a guest speaker and friend of DDJF, the one and only Dr. Jessica Whalen. Uh, if you remember from Dr. Whalen's previous appearance on the Power of Love show, we discussed narrow diversity. She has an extensive experience in the mental health field and is the owner and CEO of a national network of clinicians called Holon Inclusive Health System and adjunct faca- faculty at Maryville University. Dr. Whalen received her Bachelor of Arts from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and her Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree from Goldfarb School of Nursing at Barnes Jewish College in St. Louis. She received her Master of Science in Nursing from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and her doctorate in nursing practice at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Mm -hmm. So here today to discuss warning signs of anxiety and how to cope and help others feel supported coping with their anxieties, please welcome back Dr. Jessica Whalen to the Power of Love show. Dr. Jessica, how are you? Great. I'm glad to be back. It is so so good to see you. And and on behalf of my brother and the entire board and our community, we want to thank you for returning back to the Power of Love show and sharing your wisdom and knowledge with the community. Thank you. Um, I want to start off by asking you, can you explain a bit about the science behind, I know I'm going straight into it. The (laughs) science, there's no, there's no, how have you been since the last, none of that. Okay. We're going straight into it. Um, Dr. Whalen, Dr. Jessica, explain to me the science behind how anxiety is triggered in the body and the toxins we encounter every day that have been leading to what you refer to as the perfect storm. Yes. So this gets cut. This can be very complex at times. There's actually a lot of factors that go into anxiety. I usually like to start with the brain in neurochemicals alone. You could have anxiety from dysregulation from serotonin or dopamine or glutamate or um, acetylcholine. Your, uh, your hormones affect the brain as well. So basically there are, aren't many neurotransmitters that don't affect the ability to have anxiety. The ones that we know the best are the ones that could then get um, associated with the epinephrine and norepinephrine release, which actually comes from our adrenal glands. 
Um, when people have been under stress and trauma for long periods of time, a lot of natural paths like to talk about adrenal fatigue. It's basically when our body stops even responding to the chemicals that are being released because it can't launch, it, even if it's launching them, our body's just not even, even doing anything. It's when people are like, I have no energy left. I was anxious all my life and now I have all of this dysregulation. And a lot of those patients are actually at high risk for autoimmune conditions and everything else. Um, the immune system actually plays a huge role when it comes to anxiety and especially as it relates to acetylcholine. And what we've seen over time, and this is where, so actually my ma masters, I really wanted to focus on uh, excitotoxicity and food products that we were encountering every day and other things in the field, uh, like even plastics and stuff like that, that we're ingesting or that we're coming into contact with pesticides, hormones in our food, et cetera, and how it affects our brain. Because mm -hmm. especially, and even now today that I'm in with what I call patients who are already probably more sensitive to start with, they were already more immune dysregulated than others. Um, they're more prone to those cytokine storms that they're talking in the news. So that cytokine storm, it really is the perfect storm as we've seen it, as we'll say probably since the 1950s, we've seen an increase of things that decrease acetylcholine, also more stressors that ramp up our adrenaline and cause us to be in that trauma state. Um, and then when you add something like now COVID after all these years of kind of coming into contact with, um, it's not just carcinogens, it's basically the toxins, the pesticides, the things that are being used on our food products that really actually, if you look at them are neurotoxic. Incrementally, mm -hmm. you add those things together. So it's not just because the corn itself or the medical marijuana itself is coated in pesticides. We're encountering these all day across multiple layers of things. <laughs> so, wait, wait, I, I have to stop you for a second because you already freaked me out. Uh, <laughs> but so I have two questions. No, number one, you must, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you, like, if you go to like a Chipotle and you grab the plastic fork, are you like, I'm not going to eat from this plastic fork? Like, are there certain things you just don't do that we all are just doing freely that you're like, uh, I don't think I would do that if I, if you knew what I knew? When, yes, when I start researching certain things, like <laughs> I would highly advise if you're in, if you use medical MJ in a state where it's legal, growing your own, just saying. <laughs> really? Um, I was doing a lot of research on the pesticides and certain ones, especially for um, my patients, especially that have been struggling with anxiety, there has been use of more of um, these. And actually, so of course, I have lots of patients who have probably smoked on and off for years, whether legal or illegal. And it's interesting because as the new stuff through dispensaries are coming out, they're actually experiencing things that they hadn't before, like partial staring spells with repetitive movements, which is actually a seizure. It's a partial seizure. They never had that before, which made me start digging into what might be different in stuff that they maybe used 20 years ago versus today. And some of the things that we're using in agriculture could very well be affecting those things. If you start adding all of the other things that we're actually coming into contact with, whether it's through beef or chicken, and that's a whole, I mean, that's a whole other thing. Because yes. so allergy testing. And I've seen uh, post pandemic, especially certain foods that are um, utilizing some of these same, as I call them neurotoxins, more people are spiking the long owl allergies. Um, and this is all related to those cytokines, those cytokines that also create a lot of the anxiety. If people are feeling more anxious today, it, it really is all interrelated. I always mm -hmm. coach my patients in that, to me, the weirdest thing that we did in medicine was silo everything. Uh, you can't just look at a kidney and be like, okay, I'm only going to focus on kidney disease because our kidneys filter the blood that goes to our brain, that goes to our heart, and the cardiovascular system is all interrelated. You can, if you silo one thing, you're missing you're missing the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to look at all those factors, and that's what I would say is so important for any patient to advocate for that today. Wow. Okay.
No, no. And I have a list of questions I'm, I'm supposed to be yeah. asking, but you got me fascinated. And so this will be my last question off topic. Is there like a, a book or a website we can go to us? I don't want to say, I guess us, reg, no, I don't want to say regular, but us non-informed people can go to, to, to understand in a simple term what we need to be careful of in our everyday lives. Yes, I think actually in starting and piquing that interest, one of my uh, books that really like triggered it off for me, there's uh, a neurologist, Russell Blaylock, and he wrote a book, Excited Toxicity, The Taste That Kills. Um, and it's, I don't know how old it is now, maybe 10, 20 years, but it's so good because it kind of starts opening that door. And that's what really piqued my interest. And it has enough science in it that it's giving you some good hard fact, but at the same time, it's written in a way that if you're not medical, you can understand it. Those are my favorite type of books because most of my day in my practice, I spend trying to help my patients and almost train them to be many scientists, like ask questions, learn about this, advocate for yourself. Here's what you need to do if you're not getting the help you need at this level in the, in care, because no, I can't be, I, the, the question I get all the time. Can you be my primary care? Can you be my nephrologist? I'm like, no, I can't. I can I can only stay in my lane, but I can yeah. tell you how to get what you need to get when you need to. Okay. So. Okay. Well, I thank you for that. I, I thank you for that. I, I'm a little scared to be honest, but I'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So back to oh, our mental God. health <laughs> and, and COVID related questions, at least, because we are during in a pandemic. Yeah. Why do you believe some people with no prior feelings of anxiety or no thinking of anxieties are now experiencing an onset of it during and as a result of this COVID-19 pandemic? Yes. So again, I've always said genetics play a role. Everybody has predispositions to something. It's just how soon will it present? COVID is actually a trauma. And so it's a trauma to our society in general and globally. <laughs> And to, I've always coached my patients that trauma is the biggest epigenetic trigger. It will turn on those like negative aspects of a gene no matter what. So even if you're the person that only had one gene toward anxiety, this, may be, this would be the time that you're more likely to experience uh, in panic or feeling restless. There's lots of ways that anxiety can present. Um, I am seeing in practice a lot more of the panic attacks, the um, basically excess serotonin related people flushing, feeling overheating, feeling like they can't catch their breath, their hearts palpitating. Um, some of that is actually caused from having had COVID. Um, when I do enough digging on my patients, um, because I love to solve puzzles, Almost every person I've come in contact one way or the other, if I dig far enough, it seems they might, even if they didn't know they had COVID, we're there's an area where I'm pretty certain where I can usually find where, yes, you probably did and just didn't know it. Mm. Um, I do feel that the a majority of people uh, have experienced it. I don't think there's many people that haven't had it at least once. Um, mm -hmm. So mm. that already triggers for a lot of individuals this cytokine storm that they talk about in the news all the time. It's so important, though, because those hormones, those chemicals launching that immune response, it's the same reason that there's the fighting about vaccines versus the anti-vaccines um, and the damage they can cause. Um, from being in the science perspective of it, really getting a vaccine is ultimately safer than having the disease itself. The only problem is, is when you're launching immune response difficulties one way or the other, that launching of such magnitude of that is an, is an insult and a trigger to the body. And with the right storm, all those things I was talking about, if, if people have had all of their healthy nutrients depleted out of their food and they're not taking supplements and they have, they've been working too hard and not caring for themselves or they're stressed out because of the pandemic, it's the perfect storm to then basically have a depleted immune system that can't fight off anything. And whether you've gotten the shot or whether you got ill uh, with COVID, you're high, you're more likely even to then experience what they're calling, you know, the lo long COVID symptoms or having just anxiety in general. Mm. That's not 
to mention the fact that when people are cooped up, they're not able to socialize. Mm -hmm. A lot of our good positive endorphins actually do come from positive social interactions. And mm -hmm. I can say that even as an Aspie who introverts a lot, um, <laughs> we still need our good positive social interactions. Um, and so, um, when when they're not getting those you're not releasing oxytocin you're not releasing those things and um i think both of you are commenting on decreasing your social media i get that because a lot of the negativity will come over but not the positivity mm. I, i've noticed over time that online interacting does not seem and i would love to just hook some people up some some pet scans on this and some spec scanning i don't think it actually releases the same hormones on the positive side like the oxytocin that you get from positive social interactions i don't think it in induces those endorphins but it does induce the anxiety the panic and the mm. irritability um so people are more likely to experience the negative and if that's all we're being surrounded with most of the day because we can't really get out we can't talk to others we can't go with our friends and we're getting bombarded with the negative and having more trouble getting an actual positive social interaction, it leads to more state of trauma um, mm. across the board. That's very, very powerful. So thank you for sharing that. Um, question, what are, what symptoms, what are the signs and symptoms of anxiety that we should be looking out for? Well, I'd say, um, this again can present different in different people. The biggest things that I'm seeing with people are feeling like they're having brain fog. They can't find their words. They're having trouble concentrating. So some people feeling like they're more ADHD is what they come in my office. Some patients are legitimately having more panic attacks, which where they feel like the walls are closing in. They feel like they are flushing. They can't catch their breath. Um, some of this is actually legitimately due to cardiac. I always do a cardiac workup because if they had COVID, some patients actually do have now mitral valve regurgitation or tricuspid. We're seeing a lot of supraventricular tachycardia, which is basically abnormal heart rhythm or rate. It's a mm. rapid rate. Um, and so we're seeing more bursts of that post COVID in people. So some patients, I'm doing a very strong medical workup these days. Irritability is one. I think people negate that one a lot or don't really think about it, but that the anger outbursts and agitation are a lot of times a sign of anxiety, trouble sleeping, um, waking up through the night or maybe falling asleep okay, but then waking up at maybe like 4 or 5 a.m. and just not able to go back to bed. So in my opinion, it's genes that really influence which ones are gonna present the most, mm -hmm. but that, that anxiety difficulty, um, those are all symptoms that I'd say are more common. Nausea, vomiting, having all the body effects kind of things. Uh, so COVID seems to have messed us up a little <laughs> bit mentally and physically. Yes, very much so. Um, and we're seeing, I see it across the board both ways. And that's why for me, holistic or and why I'm whole on inclusive healthcare is because if you don't take all of those factors, it's very easy. And I've, I've seen this pre COVID. So as our healthcare practitioners have been more placed in a state of trauma from being overworked, seeing patients every 15 minutes, which is ridiculous. Um, and basically just people being put through kind of, I call it the cattle mill of healthcare. Mm -hmm. Um, I've had more and more patients over the years, and I'm not an old practitioner, that have been sent to me um, for medical reasons. And they're basically told, oh, that sounds like go see your psych for depression or anxiety. And I do the medical workup and it is coming back 101 different medical conditions. Mm -hmm. it, it is our job to rule out those medical first, but when a practitioner is only getting 15 minutes and the person's like, I'm having palpitations and I'm having anxiety and, I, and I'm flushing. Oh, it sounds like a panic attack. Go see a psych. They don't have to order any tests. They just order the referral. Bye. Um, and so I get that patient. I'm like, oh, but you're also like passing out. Oh, but you're having that. I think, yeah, we're going to do a EKG, we're going to do a cardiac workup. We're going to do. So I'm ordering these tests and patients are having legitimately both they're having anxiety but they're also having medical symptoms that are not getting addressed which only makes all the the mental health issues worse especially mm. left untreated for long periods of time 
Oh man, <laughs> you give me so much good information, um, but it's it's kind of sad and scary at the same time. Okay, uh, another uh, anxiety related question. Yep. What advice would you offer to someone who is having trouble coping mm -hmm. with any anxiety? Definitely reaching out to get help. It's never, t you know, uh, too late. But either starting with a therapist or, you know, talk therapy. Starting with a support group. And if you're in an area that still can't get out much, uh, yes, online. Even if, you know, that's all you have access to, it's a good start because after things open up, you'll be able to do in person. Mm -hmm. um, I getting in with a health pro if, if your anxiety is very significant i would say getting in with that healthcare practitioner but don't be afraid to have to try try them on like pairs of shoes yeah um, because right now that's the biggest thing i advocate for my patients right now with the burnout and fatigue i'm, I'm helping with the pocn network and one of the things we're looking at right now is stress burnout and fatigue um and it's the numbers are astronomical. I've been, I'm seeing reports of about 80% of practitioners uh, indicating stress, burnout, and fatigue, which wow. leads to mistakes at work and, and everything like that. So if you're not feeling you're getting somewhere, if you're feeling like you're not being heard, mm -hmm. don't be afraid to go try someone, like try someone else. And it's not you. Mm -hmm. It's They could be having their own things going on. He uh, yeah. Health practitioners are human. So you know, we want to do our best, but if you're just not getting what you feel you need to get that anxiety managed, um, we always talk about self-care, setting boundaries with your work. Like if you, at all possible, half of us let ourselves get into this pattern of working 14, 16 hour days, not sleeping enough, not eating nutritious and just grabbing whatever's first that that's some of the worst stuff we can do we're just compounding all those issues i talked about earlier we're compounding it um, mm -hmm. because we're not being mindful of our own self-care we're not being mindful of how our body needs relaxation our body needs time off work our body needs to sleep it, otherwise you can't reset your uh cortisol and you can't reset your adrenaline and all of those things just keep pumping out to our body doesn't respond to them anymore. And that's when you get all kinds of health problems. Yeah. So I was going to ask you for some coping mechanisms or techniques for handling anxiety. I think you gave us some, but if you want to, to elaborate, I know seeing a professional like yourself would be ideal, but in the case of everyday type of things that can be done, that is simple. Yeah. What would you advise? Starting even even small and trying to get better sleep schedule. That's the first thing I always tell patients is, and if you're not sleeping, get something even over the counter if you have to, you know, something light. I, you know, for some patients, low dose melatonin. A lot of times they'll go grab that 10 milligram bottle. Actually, it works better in a lower dose. Uh, the lower the dose, the better. Uh, it is a hormone, so you don't want to overdo it. Um, so it, there's also, you know, yes, you could take a Benadryl or the Unisoms or whatever. Getting your sleep pattern, my minimum, even with, I call them my like hyper-functional people that are excess dopamine up here and they're super smart. Uh, I usually, even if they're normally a six hour person, that's my minimum. I say no less than six hours a day. If you're getting less than that, you're not going to reset your hormones. So I'd say that's number one. Number two would be eating. I like trying to be more mindful of just eating more rounded and more healthy. It's very hard to do when we're go, 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 go. And our mind is, but if we can take that and be mindful of it, that's a, that is a way we can significantly get in the positive nutrients to help combat all of the cytokine storms slash the hormone dysregulations we may be having. Um, so focusing on that. Um, and the third biggest one I would say is if you can make time, schedule something to do for you. I don't, you know, whether it's exercise, whether it's taking a deep breath, whether it's doing meditation, but for my patients with exercising, I always say 15 minutes a day keeps the nervous breakdown away. So you don't have to schedule that hour of exercise. Do 15 minutes of cardio, 15 minutes of meditation, like pick an hour block and make that your like self-care block where you're going to do a couple of those things. And I think that would be the three, the top three. That's what I would do. I'm going to, uh, Todd, you, were you wanting to say something? Because I wanted to say something real quick. So is number three more about exercise or is it more about 
um, doing something for yourself. Self care for yourself. Exercise okay. is good, but I was like, if you if you use it, like you can even do just fifteen. So you can use that hour block. I just tell people try and do that. And fourth one would be so like socialize on some level. Um, mm getting positive care, like positive interactions, um, not just I, tweeting. <laughs> but I, like I have, to, I have to say, because I, I consciously around the middle of July um, tried to implement actually just healthier habits mm -hmm. and that entailed eating healthier, sleeping more, um, and exercising every day. So I actually did the first three yeah. Just kind of because I was in a funk. I, I felt mm -hmm. like, you know, I was at the highest I've ever been weight wise. I felt my mind was, was, you know, just, it, I was just in a funk. Yes. And I have to say a month and a half later, I feel like myself again. I feel so sure. much better. And I feel mm -hmm. I really can attribute it to those at least four first three things for me. I, I think I get a good amount of socialist, socialist, uh, Social connection. <laughs> social, yeah, don't want to open that bag. Words, but <laughs> you know what I mean? I get enough of my social connections uh, with my kids and family and seeing friends and stuff. But those first three I was missing out on. And mm -hmm. after a month and a half of doing it, I have to say I, I've been very, I feel way, way better. Yeah. So I love your advice tremendously. Yeah. Yeah. Now I have another question though. What <laughs> advice would you give to someone who wants to be a support person for someone with anxiety? Mm -hmm. What can we do to help those in our lives who may be struggling, uh, struggling at this time? All right. Well, my biggest advice here, don't be codependent. Uh, <laughs> so make sure you have yourself taken care of before you start taking care of others. Because if you're not in a good state yet, and then you start trying to care for others, <laughs> you'll both implode um, usually because it's just so it takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of ability to boundary set. If you're not in a good, healthy space, it's not that you can't be supportive and um, help them like feel heard, but to actually get in there and to do active things for individuals, I would say you want to definitely make sure that you're in a place and feeling that you're on point. Um, mm -hmm. Outside of that, if you're the person that you're like, well, I kind of feel like maybe I'm, I am kind of in a funk still and I don't feel that having your list of like tools, resources to help that friend with. So mm -hmm. you might have like here some groups that I know are helpful in, in town for those friends that ask you and are seemingly anxious or here's a provider or a free, you know, it meets up every week or here's a free exercise tool so that when you are listening because just listening and feeling heard helps a lot of individuals so being just a good listener is a big part of it mm. uh, especially with social isolation people just feel isolated and unheard and that leads to more anxiety um i just keep your like little bag of tricks to help you know with offering the advice and things like yeah. that yeah, there's some good questions here. There's one from Angie that says, this is all, or comments, this is all tr so true. I think stressors over the past year or so may have triggered my partner's ulcerative. Ulcerative colitis. Thank you. It's You're also welcome. interdependent. Um, Jennifer says, drink water, exercise, and sleep. Repeat this on every episode. All your guest panels have been saying this. Yeah. Uh, I think you are right. Those are yeah. things that I have really taken advantage of or started to doing and it's been making a huge difference yes. um, and then there was one question from the weird that I wanted to highlight that I'm not finding now but basically she wanted to know what do you do if you're thinking you're struggling with anxiety but your family doesn't isn't taking it seriously what would you advise to that person yes here we go I have anxiety and my father denies there's anything wrong with me and does not listen what would you advise to someone? How, how do we break it down to uh, to maybe family members to, to teach them? Well, this also, I think, ties into a question about breaking down stigma and, and that social awareness. We can't change necessarily your dad's opinion overnight, but as a community, we can continue to educate and support. For this person in particular, I had the same scenario 
when I was, you know, it was probably all my autism all along. I went to my parents and they were like, oh, you're just being a drama queen. There's nothing wrong with you. But I was basically melting down at them in their room one night. And I was just like, I need to talk to someone. I need a therapist. And they were like, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just a teen. Um, that minimizing of someone's personal experience, I never try to do. It's actually how I disengage myself. I don't believe in somatization disorders. So I don't believe in disorders that just exist in your head. Um, I do believe that our psyche is powerful, but I don't believe that things are just all in here. And so it, it's too interdependent. The chemicals here are affecting down here. So every time I've had those patients, there is something usually physically going on or something you need to be addressed. Um, most kids today can reach out. Um, in most states, there are laws. So if you're younger that you can reach out to therapists and you don't need a, um, an adult necessarily. Um, the hardest part is with the insurance and things like that. Um, but even if you weren't going the provider route yet, just starting with some of those hotlines, like the suicide hotline, There's um, there are anxiety ones and some other good resources that you can just start with. And they're all primed and prepped, those individuals answering those lines with tools and free resources usually in your community to help hit you up. Um, I know out here in Missouri, which is not the best accessible place, we even have one called like behavioral health response. If you call them, they can actually have um, like therapists come out to you almost if you feel like you're in crisis or extremely anxious or just not getting that support. So that's the time to hit the net and be like, okay, uh, support hotlines or uh, area crisis response or those sorts of things. Okay, uh, it was noisy at the house, so I had to mute it for a second. No, okay. um, but And I appreciate that answer because I think a lot of people, especially a lot of our youth are going through it. Um, I don't necessarily think I grew up with any, you know, any severe anxiety. Um, so I didn't have to walk that line, but it feels like our kids today and our youth are going up in a much more challenging time with social media. So it's cool to, to hear your response. Um, is there anything for us, anything else that we could do to maybe end the stigma to help people, um, understand you know the importance and and you know the understanding of the mental health issues that may be happening for our youth so what can we do to help in the stigma i think that that's where i take that whole body approach and and helping other people people can see um, somebody struggling with ulcerative colitis a lot they can see some of the like with the medical conditions for some reason people have been trained over longer to kind of identify that, understand it, be more cognizant. The thing is, is that mental health is the same way. It's affecting those same chemicals. And a lot of these patients are actually struggling with medical that's related. That's why I always just say, whatever whatever the person's experiencing, being that good listener first, first and foremost, since I'm on the spectrum, I had to train myself to do that. It's my, like my mentality is usually always thinking what, from my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and so as the clinician and being that very good listener, it helps me solve those puzzles because I just always assume that I'm not listening enough and that I need to try and identify the other person's experience. And that mm -hmm. helps me to really try and dig deep to help them along their journey with whatever it might be that they're struggling with. Nice. That's great stuff. Um, okay, so a uh, couple of things. Uh, first, how can people reach you? Before I get to the final message, how can people reach you, Dr. Jessica? I'm on social media. Uh, mm -hmm. I think one of my uh, staff was like, oh my gosh, I looked you up on Been Verified and your social media is on, I'm like, <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. <laughs> so I have the typical, um, it actually through my website too uh, www.highhealthsystem like hi as in hello mm -hmm. uh, dot com they can um, reach out and I have like a chat bot on there so people can reach out through there directly also um, so those are probably the best outlets and even just calling the office and saying hey I just want to talk to you uh, <laughs> I have it. a question uh, I, I'm not opposed to answering questions <laughs> love it that's awesome. Um, okay, I just wanted to make sure because sometimes my memory uh, doesn't want to cooperate. I didn't want to miss out on because I know some people are going to say, "How do we get in touch with yeah. Dr. Jessica?" Yeah. So, 
There it is. Um, www.hi h e a l t h system s y s t e m dot com high health system dot com. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Jessica, um, this is the the moment we have been waiting for. This is the no, I'm not going to do all that. Okay, what final <laughs> message? <laughs> what final message, Dr. Jessica, would you want to leave? Again, this could be anything. So. As our viewers and community knows, we end it with our, our guests talking about anything they want. So if you start talking about your favorite cooking recipe, um, it's not Dr. Jessica just deciding to talk about whatever. We gave her permission. So anything you want to talk about up to a minute, let's hear it. All right. This is my this is my spiel for everyone out there in the upl uplifting moment. We are... I'm trying to do the healthcare revolution, but we are really the healthcare revolution. So patients and providers banding together today to change and shift our system is what is going to change and shift our system. One person at a time adding together to a greater voice is what's going to help shift that. Um, so we can do that and we need to change the landscape of what healthcare looks like and together with you know our providers one-on-one. -on -one and kind of start back at the grassroots. I always joke, I wanna be Dr. Quinn medicine woman. Like, why did we get away from healthcare where you were part of the community, you knew your patients? I think it's silly that people have become more of a number and a, a medical chart. Um, I hate not having that relationship and that big understanding and to be able to like, oh, you can't afford something here, pay me in some chickens today. Like, mm. I think that's, if people, I don't know why we got away from that, but we can change the way we look at health altogether. And it's just going to take our voices all kind of collectively starting to unite to revolutionize the system. You feel we're going in the right direction? Well, I hope so, because that's what my company is all about. But <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I, I do. I, I think that is one of the things about the youth. And I think they, they are changing um, the way the structure of things. And I think that's a, a, a beautiful welcome. And I think it's going to lead to um, some strong growth and, and hopefully at least some, some, some a healthier society. Uh, Taj Jackson, was there anything else you wanted to say before I wrap up? No, this has been great. Thank you so much. Um, I love hearing about mental health in general and just... Um, Definitely the the more sleep aspect of it is something because I, I know that for me, my tolerance level disappears with lack of sleep. And mm -hmm. and that's one thing that I've realized throughout my life. So trying to work on that. Taj, that's something that I worked on as well and it made a huge difference. Now I actually take pride in sleeping longer and, and I feel so much better. <laughs> and Jojina says, I will start sleeping earlier today and try to get one hour added. So uh, nice. Don't underestimate that. And I, I think, and Taj, I don't know if you ever felt this, but I know I did. There was a time where, you know, there was a, an, um, um, an idea that was put into my head and it wasn't from a family member. So I don't want anyone being mad, but it, you know, you can sleep when you're dead, that phrase, and you got mm. so much work and so much to achieve. Yeah. And why are you sleeping so long? And I think that was, you know, trying to push me to, it's dangerous. Our body needs our sleep. You that know? is my wiring. That's actually one of my number one struggles is shutting it off when I'm hyper focused on these things. And so that's why I, imp I impress it as so important upon people because no, we shouldn't be telling ourselves it's okay. This we got to get this one thing done for work or this one thing we're doing because we're doing it to the extreme harm of ourselves and society in general. So mm -hmm. um, it is an unhealthy. Well, we will die sooner if we don't sleep. Yeah, we will yeah. be and we'll be sleeping a lot sooner. <laughs> there you go. Well said. Um, anyways, um, Dr. Jessica Whalen, I'm going to end with Lena's comment saying you're great. Uh, oh. Lena, I saw and missed a super chat from you. So on behalf of my brother and our foundation, thank you, Lena, for the super chat. Dr. Jessica, thank you for the wealth of information you gave us. Um, the community yes. loves having you, of course, for the second time. And really, just on, on behalf of everyone, our whole foundation, we want to thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you. Uh, all right, you guys. So we will be back next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Thanks for uh, joining us today, and we will see you guys next week. Have a beautiful rest of your week. Bye, everyone. Bye.